Translation, the great sage Maitreya told Vidura. When the demigods were thus reassured by the personality of Godhead, they were freed from all fears, and after offering their obeisances, they returned to their heavenly planets. Then the Lord, who is non different from the Sahasra Shirsha incarnation, got on the back of Garuda, <coughs> who carried. <coughs> who carried him to the Madhuvan forest to see his servant Dhruva. Purport. The word Sahasra Shirsha refers to the personality of Godhead known as Garbho Dakshai Vishnu. Although the Lord appeared as Shiro Dakshai Vishnu, he has been described here as Sahasra Shirsha Vishnu because he is non different from Garbho Dakshai Vishnu. <laughs> According to Srila Sanatana Goswami in his Bhagavatamrita, the Sahasra Shirsha personality of Godhead, who appeared at that time, was the incarnation known as Prishni Garbha. He created the planet known as Dhruva Loka for the habitation of Dhruv Maharaj. Just before I get into the substance of the class, I'd like to make a note to the temple leaders who are present here who may kindly consider that Srila Prabhupada didn't like vegetables being cut in the class. He, you can find in the Veda base, the, what is that sound? Cut, cut. Prabhupada said that he found it disturbing. And so I have an excuse for being disturbed by the sound of cut, cut of the flowers being cut. So you may kindly consider. Maybe it could be done at the back or something. Although actually Prabhupada didn't like the vegetables being cut, he said the, the devotees should just listen. So, anyway, Hare Krishna. It's all right, leave it for now. So here we have, Dhru the chapter is titled, Dhruva Maharaj Returns Home. And there's another chapter, I think two chapters after this, in which is just, the name of the chapter is, Dhruva Maharaj Goes Back to Godhead. So, there's an Iskon saying, we're going home back to Godhead. Never heard that one, Sarvopama Prabhu? We're going home, back to our real home. This, this uh, was said in English actually many times by Srila Bhakti at least it came up in the Harmonist, by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, that we have to go to our real home, back to Godhead. Um, there is one essay that appears in the Harmonist, the erstwhile magazine of the Gorya Mutt, which says that the Gorya Mutt is meant for directing us toward our real home, to go back to Godhead. Which is interesting when you consider that uh, it's considered by many devotees that Iskon, in general, got the philosophy wrong about the soul falling from the spiritual world. But we didn't actually fall from the spiritual world. It's something that they, some people say that Prabhupada just made this up for the sake of preaching. You know about all these? You're not tuned into. Of course, this is a very old controversy. This is going on for you know, maybe 30 years or something. But uh, the term back to Godhead was used by Bhakti Siddhanta Sasrat Thakur in English. So, we have to return to our home, to go back to Godhead. So, to, to say that we have to return and go back to Godhead means that we were there. So it wasn't something that Srila Prabhupada made up. Anyway, it's one of, that's one issue which is, uh, it's very difficult to ascertain exactly one way or the other from, directly from the statements of Srila Prabhupada and from Shastra because you can find statements which support either position, the fall vad or the no fall vad, or whatever you want to call it. Anyway, uh, this, title, this chapter is titled Dhruva Maharaj Returns Home and we might think it means he's going back to Godhead but not just yet when it says back to he returns home 
<coughs> it means he actually went back to his house, to his father's house. Which might seem strange, because if you've had the vision of Lord Vishnu and you're fully Krishna conscious, then why would you want to go back to your materialistic home, especially when they treated you so badly that you ran away from home in the first place? Ami ghore na jaibo bane prabeshibo oli la roshera tore, but you know Thakur says, that he will go to, I will go to Vrindavan, I will enter into the forest, I won't go back home for the sake of attaining Krishna consciousness. But Dhruva Maharaj does return home. Lord Vishnu has some service for him to do in the material world. It's not that everyone who becomes a perfect devotee, that they immediately leave this world Many of them stay in the world for the sake of serving Lord Vishnu, especially by preaching. Of course, we don't find that Dhruva Maharaj, we don't, it's not directly stated that he was preaching Krishna conscious, although it's assumed that he did so, because pure devotees of Krishna are always absorbed in thought of Krishna, and they like to talk about Krishna. So even though it's not directly stated about him, it's presumed that he spoke about Krishna. His situation is similar to that of Prahlad. The two boy saints, Dhruva and Prahlad. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu especially liked to hear about Dhruva and Prahlad. He used to hear about the Bhagavatam from Gadadha Pandit. It's very interesting, isn't it? Because Gaur Gadadha, the worship of Gaur Gadadha, is especially meant for devotees in situated in Madhurya Rasa, the highest platform of Krishna consciousness. But when Gaur and Gadadha came together for discussing the topmost scripture of Rasa, then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu especially liked to hear about Dhruva Maharaj and Prahlad Maharaj. So they both had in common unkind fathers, although Prahlad's was considerably worse than Dhruva's. Um, and that after having darshan of the Lord, they continued to remain in the world as kings for a very long period. <coughs> Prahlad, he, uh, he fathered his most famous son, was Virochana, who would have given great pleasure to Hiranyakashipu if Hiranyakashipu hadn't had his intestines ripped out by Nushingadev prior to the birth of Virochana. Uh, Virochana was following the good family tradition of being a first class demon. But Virochana's one son was Bali, and Prahlad preached to him. Prahlad was the guru of Bali, who got mixed up, Bali Maharaj got mixed up with the demons, but ultimately by the intervention of Vamanadi was <coughs> delivered to pure Krishna consciousness. <coughs> so pure devotees of the world, they may remain in this world even after becoming enlightened. They don't necessarily go back to Godhead immediately because there's a lot of important work to do in this world. Even if they're not directly preaching, it's important to have Krishna conscious leaders who understand what the whole universe is for. Krishna conscious leaders like Dhruva Maharaj and Prahlad Maharaj, they have some duty in administering the universe, but their position 
in doing so is more important than that, than that of the demigods, because the demigods themselves, they don't, <coughs> most of them don't appear to have a very clear realization of what the whole universe is for. They understand that we should worship Lord Vishnu, that he's the supreme, but they're not that much interested in, or not very interested at all, in becoming fully Krishna conscious, free from all material desires, and going back to Godhead. So, although they are overseeing the affairs of the universe under the guidance of Lord Vishnu, they, uh, in outlook, in many ways, they're not very different from the demons who they're always fighting with. Because both the demigods and the demons are interested in enjoying the facilities of the universe, whereas the demigods the difference is that the demigods recognize that Lord Vishnu is supreme and they might theoretically recognize that the ultimate goal of life is to go back to Godhead. But like I said, they're not, they're not in too much of a hurry for that. They're busy enjoying themselves in the heavenly planets and trying to keep the demons out. So Prahlad and Dhruv Maharaj, they are universal administrators. Dhruv Maharaj is still there. He wanted a kingdom like greater than that of Lord Brahma, so he had to have a... To be, to be meaningful, his lifespan would have to be very long also, like that of Lord Brahma. So he's still there, fixed in the Dhruva Tara known as the pole star in English. <coughs> and they, they're performing administrative duties, but they, they don't become bewildered like the demigods, like ordinary demigods. They're, they're fixed in the understanding that we are meant for surrendering to Lord Vishnu. That is the difference between the demigods and the devotees. The demigods, they worship Lord Vishnu, but they are sakamantas. Therefore, they, they cannot actually surrender to Lord Vishnu. One can only actually surrender to Lord Vishnu if he gives up his material desires, or at least has the intention to give up material desires. There are several definitions of bhakti, given in Shastra, Rupa Goswami has summarized the process of pure devotional service, drawing on different Shastric sources, by saying at the beginning of his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, introducing the subject matter of Bhakti, <coughs> Anyabhila Shita Anyabhila shita shunyam jnana kama dhyana avritam anukum yena krishna nishilana bhakti rutama. So this subsumes the various definitions of bhakti. What are some definitions of bhakti given in Shastra? What's one definition from Narada Pancharatra? Very famous. Sarva upadhi vinir muktam tatparatvena nirmalam vishikena vishikesha sevanam bhaktir uchate. Bhaktir uchate. That means it's definition. It is, this is said to be bhakti. When one is free from all mundane designations, so, and one's heart is pure, one is absorbed in the Supreme Lord and is serving the master of the senses with one's senses. So that's another. Then a very important definition. Uh, it's actually a definition of the, specifically of the highest dharma. What is that? From Bhagavatam. Savai pung sang paro dharamo yato bhaktir adhokshati. Ahaituki, apratihata, yayatma supersedati. The topmost 
dharma for all living beings is that by which bhakti to adhoksaja is affected. Adhoksaja, this means the Supreme Lord who is beyond the mundane senses. So it, this means that this, again, has to be enacted on the spiritual platform. And that bhakti has to be ahaituki apratihata, without any personal desire, and apratihata, unstoppable. There's no holidays, there's no tea breaks. Whatever happens, even if, as we see in the case of Bali Maharaj, everything was taken away from him. And in his case, everything meant everything, literally. Everything in the universe, because he conquered the universe. So if everything is taken away from me or you, it's not that much, because we don't have that much. But Bali Maharaj had everything. And everything was taken away from him, and he went on with his birth. There was nothing that was going to stop him. Whatever happened, sickness, whatever, the resolution to go up in bhakti. So, and this will make one actually happy. So the essence of all these definitions of bhakti is subsumed in anyabhilashitashunyam, that the topmost level of bhakti is the favorable cultivation of Krishna consciousness with the attitude of being desireless, cultivating desirelessness, not cultivating desires on the platform of karma or jnana. So, <coughs> devotees such as Dhruva and Prahlad they understand this. And therefore, apart from being administers in the universe, they can, they can uh, impart, they can, by their activities, by their words, they actually affect the purpose of the universe. Because the conditioned souls, including the demigods, think that the purpose of the universe is to enjoy it themselves. Whereas the spiritually realized persons, they understand that this is, universe is not a place of our enjoyment, and therefore they try to get out of it. And the fully spiritually realized persons, they understand that everything in the world is meant for the service of Krishna, for his pleasure only. And therefore they direct other persons to do that, that Krishna should be served. Everything is meant for the pleasure of of Krishna, not for ourselves. Idam Narayanaya. What's the next line? Ah, well, I. Idam Narayana. Idam Namama. Yes, sorry. For Narayana, whoever. This is meant for in the sacrifice. We say this is meant in a Vaishnava home. We offer, this is meant for Narayana, not for me. So it's repeated over and over again with different names of Vishnu. It's not meant for me. Nothing is meant for me. The devotees of the Lord, they understand this and therefore they act, they live in the world, even though they're self-realized, they live in the world for the sake of purifying it. That Prahlad Maharaj said that I have been called, he said to Lord Vishnu, I have been called to this world to demonstrate the character of a pure devotee. So such persons, they live in this world, but they are not affected by it. There is an example in Bhagavad Gita of living in this world and not being affected by it. Who can think of that example? Here we have some interactive teaching. Anyone can think of it? Huh? Shukadev? Shukadev Goswami. No, there's an example, means Padra Padra Nivam Bhasa. Just like the lotus lives in the water, but it's above the water. 
So there's another verse from Narad Pancharatra which discusses this. Someone who lives in this world but is liberated. Eha yasya harer dasye karmana manasagira nikelasvapyavasthasu jivan mukta sauchate. Eha, in this world. Of one who lives in this world on the principle of haridasya. I meant for serving Lord Hari. By karmana manasagira. So karma means by activities. Mana means by the mind and gira means, who knows that word? Gira means by words. So in all, nikil, which means in all, in all circumstances, whatsoever, whatever comes. He continues with this principle, such a person is called jivan mukta. Even while living in this world, is liberated. He doesn't have to wait to go back to Godhead or to leave the body to become liberated. Even though the body is subjected to the conditions of this material world, even the body of a liberated soul may be subjected to the conditions of this world. Even if a great devotee goes out in the rain, generally an umbrella should be used. Otherwise, you'll get wet and sick. It's only you say, well, it's only the body, the body. But he, he doesn't identify with the body. Even though the body may get sick, old, tired, die, but he's jivan mukta. He's not affected by the body. So great pure devotees, <coughs> they live in this world for the benefit of others. In Buddhism, there's also, in this Mahayana Buddhism, there's the concept of the Bodhisattva, the person who becomes self-realized but takes various incarnations just to benefit the world, which is ridiculous because, in the context of Buddhism, it's ridiculous because in Buddhism, there isn't any world. There, there's no, there's no mercy. There's no com all any concept or anything. Anyway, it's all nothing. I mean, their whole their whole philosophy is it's a big zero, literally. It's not a big zero. A zero is neither big or small. A zero is zero. Their whole philosophy is zero. They have so many books describing nothing. And they have different schools of Buddhism who argue with each other over the nature of nothing. So we can say this is real empty-headedness, not just empty-headedness, but emptiness. So the pure devotees of the Lord, they are actually merciful in as much as they live in this world for the benefit of others. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, <coughs> he exemplified this principle. He wanted his followers to exemplify this principle also. That the person of the highest level of consciousness lives for the benefit of others acts for the benefit of others. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu quoted, actually from Bhagavata, Krishna, about the, about the trees. What is that verse? Aho varam, aho eha varam janna dehinam hi dehishu pranar atha dhyava chat shraya acharanam sada. That the, the example is given of the trees and then of magnanimous persons. Their life is fully successful. By dedicating their life, their money, their intelligence and their words 
They always act for the benefit of others. The Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself set this example. Even though he came as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to <coughs> relish the sweetness of himself, he, he is Anta, Anta Krishna Bahia Gora. He's Krishna, but he's come as Gora. And he is Radha Bhava Duty Suvalitam. He is Krishna covered with the mood and the bodily luster of Radharani. So he came for the purpose, as described in Chaitanya Charitamrita, of Rasa Niryasa relishing the nectar of himself, but he didn't neglect to act for the benefit of others. He traveled widely, he preached, he sent others out to preach. He wanted that his followers not simply act for their own benefit, but act for the benefit of the whole world by distributing Krishna consciousness. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sent Nityananda Prabhu to preach in Bengal. He <coughs> sent his uh, intimate devotees, known as the six Goswamis. Actually, he sent seven, Lokanath also, and Bhugarbha, eight, to Vrindavan to perform activities for the benefit of others. Sadharma sthapana by reviving the culture of Vrindavan, by writing books. The six Goswamis, they set the they, they made the foundation, the philosophical foundation for the present Krishna conscious movement. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he traveled widely and preached, and whoever he met, he inspired them with Krishna consciousness and ordered them to give that to others also. So the, this parampara is going on. Srila Prabhupada inspired others in Krishna, not just inspired, he, he trained them, <coughs> taught them, provided books for them, but he told them. That, told them means told us, you have to give this to others. It's not just meant for one's own relishing. Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur in particular was very much against the idea of Nirjan Bhajan, that one simply sits alone by himself and chants Hare Krishna. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told us to chant Hare Krishna, so he told us that there's nothing higher than chanting Hare Krishna, so why not just chant Hare Krishna and do nothing else? Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also said to preach, to spread this. And the Acharya of the Holy Name, the greatest example of chanting Hare Krishna, who, who no one can, uh, it's very difficult, hardly anyone can come up to his standard of chanting so many names of Krishna, but he also preached. That's Haridash Thakur. So, this movement is meant for giving benefit to others. Dhruv Maharaj went home not simply to uh, show his father, you see, I'm better than you. He didn't have any such ambition. He had no material ambition whatsoever. But on the order of the Supreme Law, this will all be discussed later in this chapter. Even though he was fully spiritually realized, he had no aspiration for anything in this world, and by the force of his Krishna consciousness, he had no duty in this material world, actually. He had nothing to do. He's already free from all obligations in this material world by the power of his Krishna consciousness. He could have just gone back to Godhead. But on the order of Lord Vishnu, he came into this, he returned to this world, to worldly activities, for the benefit of others. Just like Srila Prabhupada, he was living in Vrindavan, he had, for his own sake, he had nothing to do. He could have chanted Hare Krishna and gone back to Godhead. But he came out, he took the risk, he traveled all over the world. He, 
took so much trouble. Srila Prabhupada was working so hard. No one worked as hard as Prabhupada. Although somehow or other he also always appeared very relaxed and people came to see him, they had time for them. Of course, to a limited degree, I mean. But he would spend time every day discussing with people. The Srila Prabhupada, he set the example of working hard in Krishna's service. He, because he wanted, he had the pure desire to help others come to the platform of Krishna consciousness. So although it's not directly stated in this chapter about Dhruva Maharaj preaching Krishna consciousness, obviously he's going back into the world to effect the will of Lord Vishnu which means to share what he has received with others. So this is an important lesson we can ascertain from this narration, especially as our own Srila Prabhupada so much emphasized the preaching of Krishna consciousness. Preaching doesn't mean simply to collect a number of people but it means, <coughs> what is that? Jiva Viparit Ruchi. What is it called? Jiva Viparit To change the perverted taste of the conditioned souls. To effect a change of heart. That is only possible if one's own heart has been changed. So, Bhagavatam brings about that change of heart, pure devotional service, the change in heart. Vidyate, Hridhyagrantis, Chidyante, Sarva Aha. All the misconceptions slashed to pieces, all, all the attachments slashed to pieces, all the doubts. Uh, cleared, fully situated in pure devotional service. Of course this takes time, this verse, or this part of the verse which I quoted comes in that series of verses, beginning with Nashta Prayesh Bhavadreshu, that the impurities in the heart are almost completely destroyed. And by hearing Bhagavatam, the devotee says, why only, al why only almost? Actually, they're fully destroyed, but this suggests, takes some time, there's a, it's an ongoing process. And then when the point comes of Hidyate Hridya Grantis, Chidyante Sarva Sanshaya, when all the <coughs> impurities are completely cleaned out, then Stitta Matna proceeded. Then we're situated in a position of constitutional happiness. Hare Krishna. Is there any question about this comment? Thank you for managing to stay awake. I didn't see anyone dozing off. Yes. What about the Pandava's salvation? Well, that's a very relevant question for the class. Well, I don't remember talking about the Pandavas. Yeah. The living. Where, where's the mic? It's supposed to be a mic. The question is, what about the Pandavas' salvation? Okay, now you have to try and make it somehow or other relevant to the class. Okay, we'll give you a few minutes to think about it while the mic comes. See if you can somehow or other put it together. All right, your time is up. Give your thesis, defend your thesis. Uh -huh. Yeah. And 
They went to Swaraga. Well, I still don't see what it's got to do with the class. The Pandavas went to Swaraga according to the Mahabharata. Why didn't they go back to Godhead? Well, what makes you think they didn't go back to Godhead? Because Vyasadeva said in Mahabharata that they went to Swarga. Well, he also said in Mahabharata that when Parikshit Maharaj was told of his curse, he made a fault. So, what do you believe? You want to believe Vyasadeva or Shukadeva? <laughs> If there's any uh, discrepancy, if there's any discrepancy, then Bhagavatam is accepted as the topmost evidence. Mahabharata is also, at least the version of Mahabharata we have is particularly meant for. Oh, wait a minute! I'm not allowed to say that. Shudra Bandhunam, Shudra Dvija Bandhunam, Try. Naveda Gochara. It's meant for Shudras and friends of Brahmins and another class who are not supposed to say it, who are not worthy for understanding the three Vedas. So, what is in, in the edition of Mahabharata that we have, it's not necessarily the topmost end. It's written for karmas. There is another Mahabharata of which there is a fragment extant called the Jaimani Mahabharata, which is more devotional, meant for the devotees. If Yasadeh said in Mahabharata, then they must have gone also. But they're always, the Pandavas are always with Krishna. So maybe just like Shukadeva Goswami, there's another Shukadeva also who, apart from the one described in Bhagavatam, who left home and his father was calling out Putra, Putra, Putriti, and only the trees echoed in reply. Apart from that, there was one Shukadeva who came back and became a nice householder and had children, and his children are described. So. There may be more than one form, but the Shukadev we are interested in hearing about is the one who spoke to Pariksit and who was Tamsava Hridaya Bhuta Ana Odisa Munimana Tosmi, the Shukadev who is the great Rishi who can enter into the hearts of everyone. That's the Shukadev we are interested in. And the Karamis they may be more interested in the Shukadev, who was a good family man and had lots of children. Maybe. I'm making a suggestion here. There are many mysterious things in Shastra, no doubt. To fully understand them isn't possible, but we should try to do so as far as possible. In fact, that's true about everything. Even on the mundane platform, you can't, you can't understand anything fully. Just like, for instance, little children at school, they learn 1 plus 1 equals 2. But, what is a number? We have a reply from the Bhaktivedanta Institute. What is a number? There's no such thing. It's only a symbol which represents a concept. There's no such thing as one. It has to be one something. Mathematics is can be applied practically, but it's the concepts are the very concept of a number. What is a number? And you can have a huge philosophical debate over that and probably not come to any conclusion. Does it exist? Does a line exist? In mathematics, trigonometry, lines and points, but it's, it's undefinable. You can't precisely define a line or a point. It's not possible to do so. 
So it's it's not possible to understand anything fully. What to speak of Urukram. The Supreme Lord is described in this verse as Urukram. <coughs> Which means he who has big steps. Literally means he who has big steps. Which refers to, you tell me, which which avatar? Urukram means Vamanadei. All right. What's your name? Vamanadei Das. All right. You got a mention in the Srimad Bhagavatam this morning. <laughs> all right. Well, Hare Krishna and all glories to Urukram. And all glories to Srila Prabhupada. And all glories to Srimad Bhagavatam. And thank you for listening to this wandering ramblings. Hare Krishna. Oh, and by the way, I do sometimes present something systematically when I write books. And I have some available today which I didn't have yesterday. So, if anyone wants to find out, there is a better side of me also. <laughs> You can get it in the books, but you have to pay for it. Hare Krishna. Some books are available here. Hare Krishna. The Pandavas all went to hell. No, Yudhishthira had a vision of hell, not all the Pandavas. Because the version I read described. Yudhishthira apparently went to hell. He had like a vision of hell. He went to heaven and he saw Duryodhana there. Yeah, and then he went to hell. Yeah. What the heck is going on? And Lord Indra said, well, what do you want? And, and uh, he said, I want to be with the Pandavas. So Lord Indra said, All right, then they, 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 all the Pandavas are in hell. But it was only a vision. But the vision is just as bad. A nightmare is just as bad as the real thing while you're experiencing it. That's true. <laughs> Prabhupada suggested that he sometimes got nightmares. Because he said in one purport that due to the sinful activities of, of disciples, the spiritual master sometimes sees nightmares. So it suggests that Prabhupada himself sometimes had nightmares. Difficult to understand, right? Yeah?